Hey, what's up guys? This is Sumner from LandInvestor.co and in this video, you're gonna learn from Mayer about his double close strategy. How he's closing hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of land deals without putting a single dollar into acquisitions to actually pay for the deals. You're gonna learn the ins and outs of his strategies, how he's doing double close, all these really interesting creative avenues to get deals done. Mayer is one of, first off, one of the coolest guys I know in the land investing industry, but he's a real deal maker. This guy gets it. The guy knows how to put together deals. He'll go through great lengths to get deals done and he's just a wealth of knowledge. Not only that, he's a phenomenal entrepreneur. He knows how to build a heck of a business. So I think you guys are really gonna enjoy this one. Stick around, let's dive into it. All right guys, how's it going? This is Sumner from landinvestor.co and today I'm joined by my good friend, Mayor. We're gonna do a little fireside chat. Imagine you're a fly on the wall. We're just riffing, talking like we would if we were in person. And you're gonna hear from two guys that are doing this full time. The interesting thing is, Mayor and I have a very different way about going uh, about this business. We skin the cat in a different fashion. And I always say, there's so many ways to go about building a profitable land investing business. So I'm really excited for today's interview. To start it off, Mayor, first off, I appreciate being here, man. But to start it off, let's talk about the most memorable deal you've done to date. Could be a cool story, most profitable, fill in the blank. Let's hear it. Sure. So before we get started, I want to thank you, Sumner, for everything you do for the, the land investing community. I mean, you, you teach a lot, you coach, but you also really, really care about uh, people in this business. And I don't know, from, from when we first met, I felt like you were somebody that I could really talk about what's going on, not just on the business level, but on the personal level, how this is affecting me. And like, it, it's amazing to be able to have someone who like a listening ear and someone that's really uh, sharing open book. You're always just there for everybody. So I really, I really want to thank you for that. Appreciate it. Brother. Um, also, um, shout out to your course. It's very really good. Um, <laughs> I didn't pay. I didn't pay Mayor to say any of no, that. I know you didn't. I know you didn't. This is a shameless plug. I appreciate me. it. But um, uh, no, it, it's really like like a, it it it's gone. What I said about you being an open book and like you really show people how to do things the way you do them, and and it's really good. And I just want to thank you publicly for it. Thank you. Okay, as far as my uh, my most memorable deal, so I'm gonna go with my first deal, go. and. And it's memorable not just because it was my first deal, but it's memorable because I learned a lot of things. It was a buy for nine thousand and supposedly sell for thirty five thousand, um, which is great. Um, I called an agent. I said, "You go check it out." She checked it out and said it was worth thirty five, forty. Great. Anyway. We list the property and it turns out nobody wants to buy it. And the reason is because the property is in a 90 degree angle. <laughs> and I called her up and I said, hey, I, I thought you went to see the property. She's like, well, I saw it online and I saw that the property across the street, which is flat, uh, sold for 40. So I figured, you know, 35 were safe, but this was literally like a cliff like that. <laughs> anyway, it was very... Um, very stressful, you know, it was like the first deal and I bought it. I wasn't like double closing it. Like I had money in there and, and I ended up selling it for $13,000. Um, so, you know, I made some money, but, um, so, so I learned a lot of things, but one lesson that I learned, um, is don't trust agents just blindly, you know, like, like do your research. Obviously now I look at topography, I look at a million things. I didn't know what the hell I was doing then, but, but just, yeah, that, that's one lesson that when I went into this, I was like, yeah, if an agent said an agent said, you know, it doesn't really mean anything. I mean, it means something, but not everything. Not much. I mean, I think in particular with lands, like it typically means very, very little. And even when we're getting comps from realtors, they pass them off to my team. I'm like, this doesn't mean this is for certain. Like in a lot of cases, you got to read between the lines and in most situations, I find that if you're just going off of a, a realtor from Zillow or Redfin or fill in the blank website, um, you, even if you're just getting started, you probably know more than they do about land. And that's just the, the, the kind of the cold hard truth about it. Dude, it's right. funny. My first probably dozen or so deals, and they weren't all 90 degree angles, but I bought a lot of those initially. And what's crazy about this business is even if you screw it up so bad, you can still make some money or break even. And if you come from any other traditional investment world, uh, and you were probably trying to build a business from the beginning, but like if you look at it in terms of an investment to make to put nine grand in and make thirteen, how long did that take you? A couple months? Yeah, it took a while. Yeah. yeah, which is pretty insane. So even if you mess up, there's such a margin of safety in this business, uh, which I always kind of trip out on. And I my first dozen or so deals were just like that, small small returns. 
but even that was exciting enough to get me get me rolling. I was like, you know what, what was cool about this deal is another big lesson that I learned. First of all, because I think it was a big blessing in disguise. And the blessing was I had to really hustle this. So I had to learn everything because I had money. If this was a simple flip and I made 20 grand right away, I wouldn't have learned nothing. But because it wasn't, you know, so here's what I did. I, I, I was literally learning on the job. So I called every single person who bought land in the area. And it was in Joshua Tree. Obviously, I'm in LA. Everybody wants land in Joshua Tree. That's where I went. And I came across this guy who just owns a ton of land. And I called him. I literally skip traced him. I learned how to skip trace. I, I learned all these things on the job because I had to. I was forced to. Yeah. And I called this guy up. And I'm like, hey, do you want to buy my land? And he's like, who are you and how'd you get my number? And we ended up speaking for an hour and we became good friends. He came over to my house. We had dinner no way. and he, he, yeah, he's, um, he's a, um, very successful guy. Yeah. Um, and he just likes investing in land in that particular area. And he's like, listen, I'm not going to buy you shitty property. <laughs> but He's like, it's tiny. It's 10 grand. It's on an angle. I'm not, I'm not looking for this kind of stuff, but you have anything big like a half a million million to up to five million dollar properties i'll i'll buy it and i was like okay so this is naive me i'm like okay so i have a buyer who supposedly wants to buy big properties in the area let me do a mailer just for big properties in this area yep. you know like why not um it bombed nobody ever answered me but there was one guy who texted me from that mailer yeah and said i have 40 acres next to the airport um, and he wanted too much money. So I kept on calling this guy back and forth and back at the, the seller back and forth and he's traveling another super wealthy guy. Yeah. And my biggest like fear was that these two wealthy guys know each other. <laughs> and because how many people I own so much land in that city. Right. Anyway, it turns out that this guy, I, I pinned him down. I went for coffee with him again. All this is because I'm local. So like happens to be, but usually it's not like this, but I went out for coffee with him. And I sort of like got him to the, his lowest number yeah. and then he agreed. And then I called my buyer and I said, I have this property. It's a great property. And I gave him the highest I could possibly give him. And there was a big spread there I was able to make. And, and he agreed. He didn't know I was double closing it. Um, but he wanted to do a 1031 exchange and, and, and it was a whole thing. It took a while. It took like three months, yeah. but it worked. So, and, and I made a lot more, obviously, on that deal than on this. But because of this thing, I learned a lot. I learned so much. Um, so it's not the first time that, that happened to me where there is like a challenge, there's an issue. And because of that, I'm forced to think outside the box. And I'm forced to like innovate and figure out better ways to sell, better ways to buy, better ways to comp. So I kind of like these little challenges <laughs> because they, they're the ones that, yeah, they propel my growth. Dude, you are through and through a deal maker, man. I mean, and most people would have given up immediately on some of those. And the fact that you were able to spin out other opportunities from this crappy property on a slope is is pretty pretty amazing. Definitely a testament. No, I was, I was, I'm grateful. I think it was luck a little bit, but yeah. Dude, so this property, the, the little cheap one, buy for nine, sell for 13. How did you move that? What was the channel to get that sold? Um, yeah, I mean, it was the agent. Um, I was so upset at her, but she's super nice lady. I, it, I was, and she just had it listed on the MLS and somebody eventually came and bought it. So the way to move that was I needed to, I needed to show a vision yeah. to people. Um, let me see. I actually have a picture of every property I sold. I, I, I have them like hanging up in the wall. Let me see if I can bring it here. Let me just show you what I did to that property. Yeah. Let's see, where is this? Right here. There we go. <laughs> so I hired this guy off the internet to render me what a house will look like on that thing. I think I showed it to you once already. Yeah. So, so this was the hero image on Zillow. And as soon as I did this, which is another thing I discovered, um, people started clicking, people started inquiring, inquiring. And uh, there was a couple who came and just bought it, said, you know, they see the vision, they see, the view was insane. It was just very difficult and expensive to build. Right. Should so double that, back on it and see, see if they actually developed it. That'd be yeah, really I, can't, 
Uh -huh. So actually, I took that idea from you. We just did it on three real hard to move properties, so like these rural infill lots in Arizona. Um, so far, like the the response has been amazing. Conversion been a little bit tricky. A lot of folks that like actually think there's a house on it, and these are higher priced, or seventy to eighty grand. So it's not really plausible that there'd be a house on it, but you can almost see how they can get to that conclusion. But that's actually a really cool strategy, especially for these rural infill type properties. Was that in 29 Palms or was that in Joshua Tree proper? This is actually Yucca Valley, which is between uh, 29 Palms. Yeah. And, but it's kind of the Joshua Tree area. And then I, I ended up um, doing a lot of deals in, in the Joshua Tree area. Not like the desert squares, but more like the, the I guess you can say rural infill. Yeah. Yeah. So for about two or so years when I first got started, that was my bread and butter, most profitable market. The number of five acre lots that I flipped out there was crazy. It's totally changed now. It's actually that that market's really slowed down. We yeah. still have some inventory there and it's, it's just gone like, well, I think partially the run up was so, so steep and so fast and prices appreciated so much. Like we were buying five acre lots out there for 12, 13 grand before the pandemic. And then they were going for 30 or 40 grand acquisitions on our side. And we would sell them for 80, 75, 80, which is pretty crazy. Dude, so talk to me about this. How, how did you get into this bizarre world of flipping dirt? What was the catalyst for you? Um, so I need to give credit to my brother, uh, one, one of my brothers. He, um, so in 2020, we both were, it was COVID and we we're both trying to figure out what to do. So he somehow stumbled into this through my other brother's friend and and I started just getting very involved in PPE and, and anything to do with COVID. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and I had just, um, I just sold my, so I had a real estate like co-living business in New York where we, we would do that. So um, I left, I just had a baby. And so my partner took over and my brother was doing this and I was doing PPE and he, he was doing like $400 properties in like Arkansas. And I was like, dude, this thing is, I don't know. He's like, do it. Why don't you do it with me? I'm like, why don't you do it for a year? And then we'll see. So a year later, COVID was basically thankfully over. Yeah. Um, so, um, so I was busy with masks and that was good while it lasted, but then it was over. So I wanted to get into Airbnb. I love hospitality. So I scheduled a call with him. And I said, why don't we send mail to all these houses in Joshua Tree so see if I can buy any of them to flip as an Airbnb. So he's like, sure, yeah, let me try to do it. We go on, we schedule a Zoom, we get on Data Tree, and he teaches me how to do it. And then he's like, dude, don't do Airbnbs, do land. <laughs> so that's exactly why I sent Joshua Tree. I'm like, wow, you know, I was like, okay, yeah, screw this Airbnb thing. Let's just let's just buy land. And, and I, uh, and I started getting, so Spanish is my first language and there happens to be a lot of people in that area that speak, that Spanish is their own first language. So I started getting all these phone calls in Spanish, which was great. And I felt like, um, and I started, uh, so this guy who lives like an hour away, he's like, come here, I'll sell it to you cash and you just have to come here. I said, fine. Yeah, I'll, I'll go visit the guy. And I printed a whole purchase agreement. And I didn't know the difference between a purchase agreement and a deed. I, I, I didn't know. I had no idea. So I'm there. I FaceTime my brother and I'm like, he says he doesn't want to sign a purchase agreement, but he wants to sign the deed. I, can you explain? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, clearly that deal didn't pan out, but yeah. th that was, that was that. That was the end of COVID. Um, so it was like 2021 era. Yeah. Yeah. Dude. So funny. I, I almost forget about these, these like the origin story and what I used to do when I first got started, I was mainly flipping land in like Riverside County and then San Bernardino, Joshua tree area. And I would go and drive and meet people to sign deeds, both on the acquisition and the disposition <laughs> side. And it, it was just such a trip. And I would show up with a cashier's check title company, who cares? Like title right. search don't need to do it. Right. Um, and now I, I couldn't even imagine. And I did my first probably 50 or so deals like that, which is pretty wow. hilarious. Uh, you're probably one of the only people that's ever had a, a similar origin story in that sense of like, just putting in some freaking elbow grease, you know, I think this business is pitched as like this automation, passive income nonsense. This is a bona fide business. 
you're buying an asset for cheap, you're flipping it, you're playing an internet marketing game, trying to get some eyeballs on your listing. That's really it. Um, so you've been in this business for a little over a year or so now. Mm -hmm. What's it look like now? I know you've got an interesting strategy. Let's talk about like the team that you have, um, your acquisition channels, dispo channels, how you guys run your business today. Hey, fellow land investor, we're going to do a quick commercial break here, and that is for our land investing accelerator program. Look, if you are looking to scale and grow a six and seven figure business and go and join dozens of other land investors, you're going to want to check out the land investing accelerator program. In fact, you can actually book a one hour strategy call with yours truly to learn all the ins and outs of running a land investing business totally for free. And through that process, we'll identify if joining the land investing accelerator program is a good fit for you. This is our group coaching model. This is how we've turned beginners to seven figure land flippers in just under a few years. We've got dozens of incredible members in there. So if you're looking to grow your land business in 2023, this is the place to be. You guys can book a call with yours truly down below, or you can head over to landinvestor.co to learn more about the Leah program. Yeah. So we're a team of five, um, full time. We have acquisitions. Um, and dispo. So on the acquisition side, we do mainly tax. We send about two to three thousand texts a week. Um, we qualify them by asking them a ton of questions, making sure they're interested in selling. Um, then we we comp their properties, we make them an offer, and then we're not we, we don't we don't do a percentage. I hate like, it. We, we don't work on percentage, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't pay my mortgage with percentage. I pay yeah. with Franklin. So, like, if there's a deal that like I'm only offering ninety percent, but it's a million dollar deal, and I can make a hundred grand, I'll do it. You know. So it's yeah, it's more time consuming. Like direct mail is obviously easier in a way. It's more like they're like little Dude, it's like, little soldiers out there. For little soldiers, yeah. 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 And then, you know, the them and Pat Live, they're like fighting people. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've had great success with mail. I don't know why I'm like right now doing heavy on texting. I'm also still doing mail, but texting is kind of. Uh, I guess I like the instant feedback. I like to. I, I just it seems more human, <laughs> more 21st century. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I'm always uh, experimenting with mailing things. Like I've done email marketing. I've got some really good deals out of email, but then I have to figure that out. Like they have some goals for this quarter to figure out different methods. There's ringless voicemails that we're doing now, going straight mm. to those voicemails. Yep. Yep. Um, so we have like a cadence, like we text, voicemail, text again, mail, email. So I'm, I'm working that whole workflow. It's something that's on my it's on my plate right now to do that. And on the dispo side, we, um, as you can tell, we get really creative on how to sell properties. Um, it's interesting because I speak to a lot of land investors. I speak to gurus. I speak to people who are, you know, new, but also, you know, and like I was speaking to this guy yesterday who's literally doing a couple million dollars a year. And he told me that 55% of his, of his dispo is Facebook marketplace that he has two full-time VAs with six Facebook accounts and they're selling 55%. Like I sold two deals on Facebook marketplace <laughs> literally, and I've sold dozens of other like, and but but he says that's what it is. He said thirty well, lower lower property like lower, no, lower property. same as me same as me right. and yeah and he said thirty five percent MLS five yeah. percent um, neighbor letters five percent land dot com um, wow, it's a weird makeup. Five percent land dot com is crazy. Yeah, people swear by land dot com. They say yeah. they everything on land dot com. I, I also sold only two properties on Land.com. And I've been on a signature plan for the past two years. My stuff is literally MLS. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So but but there's obviously neighbor letters, there's calling next door neighbors, there's doing RVMs to the entire neighbor area. There's looking for people who own a lot of land, people who bought land recently, hitting them up. Um and then there's a new one that we do is we call uh, properties that are listed as investment properties and we see who the realtor was and we call them and we say, Hey, does your client want our property? So we have now like a whole workflow mm -hmm. in stages. So like when the property gets signed from the dispo side, from the acquisition side, we walk it through. So as you know, we do double closings. We not always, but we mainly try to find uh, an end buyer and we, we uh it's a win-win that's why i love this business the seller's happy they make their money the buyer's happy and whatever's left 
we pay the agent if there's an agent involved. We pay for title fees, escrow, and then we keep we keep whatever's left. Dude, that's a, that's a definitely a more comprehensive dispo strategy than than even myself, honestly. And I, ah, Facebook's a tough one. At one point, I had purchased about 30, 35 Facebook accounts. Had a VA running all of, all of them. I think I think partially it was once the lead was in our system, it like broke our internal kind of setup of how to nurture that lead. Like those leads are getting interrupted. There's so much more nurturing that needs to go into it. So my team was following the same patterns that they would with like a land.com lead. So that might've been part of it. Um, it's just a lot of work and ultimately becomes kind of expensive. It's a nut. I often think about going back to crack though, right? Um, one of the things we've been doing as well, kind of per your advice is doubling down on the neighbor letters uh, as well as the text. So we're looking at, like you said, recent sales. We're looking at properties in proximity, adjacent lots, stuff like that. And then, big LLCs that own a bunch of land. Haven't sold anything through it so far, but uh, we probably need a larger sample size. So let's talk about this, the double close stuff. Um, how quickly are you turning these properties on average? What does that look like? Um, well, December and general Q4 of 2022 was a little bit difficult. Yeah. Um, it, it, it really comes down to the price. Like, Obviously, the property needs to be good and everything else, but if a property, if we get it at a decent price and we can just turn it around real quick, yeah. um, we sometimes like we sometimes have bidding wars. You know what I mean? Like we literally listed it too low, and we have people just outbidding each other. Um, that happens a lot. I mean, thankfully, it happens. Sometimes we have properties that we think would sell for a lot more than we got them, and they're just stuck. Yeah. Um, especially last quarter, like expensive properties weren't moving, you know, properties are like three, four five hundred thousand dollars. It just weren't moving. And now actually we we're chatting about this yesterday. Things started picking up again. Um, we have multiple, um, properties on the contract with buyers, uh, you know, six figure properties. So seems like, uh, things are turning around. Um, I don't know the average time. It's a good question, but, um, it's usually if, if we don't sell it within a couple of weeks, we know it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be a couple of months. Okay. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, for, for me, too, it's like right out of the gate. Those first two weeks will pretty much tell us everything we need to know about how it's going to shake out. Yeah. Um, for you, I don't know if you know this number, but like what's your hit rate in terms of like, all right, you got 100 contracts you're going to double close on. 10 of them just fall through and you're not able to perform. Like what's that look like? Yeah, yeah. So, ten, so it was 10 percent. So it's interesting. We just. Um, we just had a team meeting right before this meeting and we have a, like a scorecard. Everybody's got like their, their KPIs. Yeah. And one of the numbers that we're tracking is how many leads fall, fall off, how many contracts fall off. And again, Q4 was difficult. So there's been more properties, but when the property falls off, it doesn't fall. Like if the contract expires, the seller still wants to sell, okay. you know what I mean? And you can always, you know, call them up and say, listen, it's just it it whatever it was a tough time or we just we're open with them we're like listen we just can't find another investor can't find another buyer to come with us on this deal and sometimes you even get a lower price <laughs> you're like i need an extension and i need a lower price <laughs> yeah. Yeah. or 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 you can just keep the property you know you've had this property for how long 20 years okay keep it 20 years and two months i'm sorry <laughs> right right so do you feel like the the deals that fall into that 10 percent is it a market selection issue? Is it a pricing issue typically? What's what's going to ride there? Or what are you seeing as a commonality? Um, pricing. Pricing, yeah. Pricing, yeah. We were off on the pricing, so we offered too much, for example. Yeah. Um, again, everything comes down to the price. Everything sells. Uh, obviously. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. yeah so, so there's the things that are easy to know before you make an offer. And does it have access? You know, is it a hot market? Like all these things we can figure out within 35 seconds, right? Pricing is the more complicated one. Yeah. So it, it, most of the properties that fell off, if I was offering them at 50% of what I was offering them at, they would sell. Right. They just, right. I couldn't, I, I wasn't making any money that way. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. Um, Here's another thing. Yeah. I'm like an eternal optimist, which is a big issue because <laughs> no, it's an issue because I like, I have this in my personal life and the business as well. Like yeah, yeah. 
I just think things will work out. I think always best case scenario. I never like, you know what I mean? So like, Dude, I see. I think that's that's a pro though. I think that keeps you coming up to hit the go, swing again, swing again, swing again. I don't know. I think in the long run, your life plays out a hundred times over again. As an optimist, it always ends up better than the pessimist. I think. But you're gonna right. get you're gonna get a few slugs in the face here and there. And, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the contract I thought it would sell for three hundred thousand because I'm an optimist. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I really. Yeah. You were the hundred, you know. You definitely, the one area I allow myself to be pessimistic is is when it comes to pricing. Like in terms of what I think it can sell for and pricing on our offers. Uh, sometimes to the point where I'm like, I think I actually miss deals because I'm so aggressive, but uh, it all works out in the long run. Um, I had a, I had a question that I was gonna. Okay, yeah, yeah. So when it comes to structuring offers, right? Whether you're doing texting or say you're doing blind offers, are you pitching an offer? with the the idea of doing a regular closing initially and then stair stepping up to a higher price or are you getting a higher yield from your marketing just from the jump you have a higher price does that make sense yeah so the way it works is when people say what's your offer we give them a range yep and the range is we want to make on these like smaller flips like the team knows we want twenty thousand profit per deal is like our minimum right Obviously, if it's a three hundred thousand dollar property, we'll try to squeeze more. But like usually in these deals, so if there isn't twenty grand to be made, we just ignore the guy. If there is, we give him enough of a range where if he says yes, we can still make twenty. Gotcha. That's basically the rule of thumb. Okay, cool. Um, let's talk about just like, and you don't have to get super duper specific, but like at any given time, do you have like lean where you just have a few, turn them over, get some more? Are you comfortable having presumably a hundred contracts or something like that? Well, it all depends how much the team can handle. So I see ourselves being able to handle right now about, we can handle like 30 with the current team. Um, And that's, we're right about there, I think. Um, Yeah, we just need to hire more dispo people, like just just scale the team. Um, And eventually, I mean, as long as the operation just stays efficient we can we can do a lot more than that right 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 and then in terms of expectation settings with sellers are you guys explaining this from the jump or hey take a look at the contract they'll piece it together do you give them continuous updates you touch your base with them or is it like sign the contract we'll talk to you in six months type thing right um yeah no we keep them updated every friday okay um it's basically this the same yeah. the same text just rephrased by like some AI chatbot. <laughs> like, hey, no news is good news. <laughs> Moving forward. Um, and as far as being open with them, so look, from the get-go, I don't tell a seller, hey, we're going to find another buyer. I don't think they care either. You know, like they know that it takes X amount of time to close it and that we give them money for the property. Like what we do with it, none of their business. A lot of times the seller is a little more savvy and they read the contract and they're like, oh, so you're gonna find another buyer and say, yes, and exactly, that's what we do. We market it, we, yeah. we'll pay for the survey if we need to, we'll do a you know, perk test, we'll get pictures, we'll, we'll bring the buyer, we'll pay for closing, we'll do everything and then we get paid, just like an agent gets paid, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think there's an irrational fear in this business of like sellers finding out that you're flipping their property. Like most times A, they know, or B, they just don't care. Like we don't just go after straight double closings, but we've had dozens of properties that were in title. We list it, we get a buyer, we almost double close on it, right? Um, And we've had some, in some cases, the seller has gone and found our listing and it's never been a big deal. Like they'll bring it to our end and oh, I didn't know you're gonna sell it so quickly or for so much, but it's never ended a deal. And so I think it's probably much the same in your situation. It's not as big of a deal as people think, right? The, the smarter the seller, the less they care. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, I'll explain to you why. Like, think about that $9,000 pro- slanted property that I had in, in Joshua Tree, right? Right. If somebody tells me, if someone's, let's say, a, a double closer, a wholesaler or whatever, and they're like, and I'm sitting on this property, like, I don't care if you find another buyer. <laughs> and like, I'm sitting on this thing. I want to move it. I'm desperate. You know what I mean? Yeah. And a guy like you comes with a land company and sends me a contract for Eleven thousand dollars. Great. I don't care if you're finding another buyer. Or I don't care. You know what I mean. And here's another thing. Just a little tip. You can always give them earnest money if you if you believe in the deal. Um, if you believe in the deal, give them money. 
Yeah, and then they know you're serious. And then what's the worst case scenario? Worst case scenario is you couldn't sell it, but they keep your earnest money, right? So it's a win-win for them. It's a win-win. And that, that's such an easy pitch, right? Like it's there's just not many objections you're going to get to a pitch like that. I've actually we've sold some of our deals in essence of like an owner finance arbitrage setup where someone's like, hey, I can go get more for it. It's like, sure, you pay us on time, you can go do whatever the hell you want with the thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's much the same here. Like if you're if you got a price in mind, seller's got a price in mind, and you can give it to them in a reasonable time period and give them earnest money, it's a done deal. Um, uh, the selling side though, I have to say, yeah. there have been some buyers that backed out when they realized that I'm not the owner right now. Okay. Yeah. If that's the price I need to pay for doing what I'm doing, sure. Yeah, it's not not a, not a huge thing. They always say, like, close on it first and then come back to me. Okay, if they're the only buyer, they'll do it. <laughs> but usually, I, like, I have other buyers. Like, it's fine. So are they finding that out, like, through a title report? Or are they doing their own they, title search? Prior? They send the purchase agreement. They, when they send me the offer, I always have to tell them, hey, um, put my company name in the offer because I'm the one who's going to be selling it. But if it's through an agent... They just pull the property records from online and they'll put my seller's name on there. And then, and then title gets confused (laughs) because so they need to have my name under, under the contract. In in terms of like a percentage of how many deals fall apart because of that, I imagine it's minuscule, but like. I had that issue. It's interesting. I had one property that every single buyer had the same issue. (laughs) One property. It was crazy. And then I had another property that. But I had so many buyers for that property. So like this girl who did she didn't want to do it because I didn't own it. I was like, okay. Yeah. And here's another thing, by the way. Very important tip, especially for people getting in this business. Don't get attached to buyers or to sellers or to anything. Like I have this thing and I always tell sellers this on the phone. I say, like, God has a plan. Like, if this is not meant to be, it's really not meant to be. <laughs> like, if you don't want to sell me your property, that's totally fine. Like, I don't need your property. You know what I mean? I'm here to solve your problem. You have a piece of dirt. You want money. I'm here to give you the money. You don't want it. Totally fine. Same with the buyer. Like the buyer starts asking you like mineral rights and you don't have it. I'm like, dude, dude. <laughs> to the mineral rights. That's my least favorite question. If you don't want to buy it, don't buy it. You know, I need to buy it.